Good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Halte, and I'm the Executive Director of the Victoria Law Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a better information session today on community legal education, perfectly timed ahead of Law Week, which I'm sure you're all as excited about as, as we are at the Foundation. Well, so many of us involved in community le legal education, developing it and delivering it and getting it right can mean the difference between a level of confidence and, and great confusion for Victorians who are looking for legal help. So it is really important that we use our best endeavours to make sure our CLE is as effective as possible. And as you're all aware, Victoria Legal Aid has deep experience in this, and Alison Hose and Andrea Staunton, both expert senior community legal education coordinators at VLA, will take us on a tour behind their scenes on doing effective CLE in just a sec. But first, it's my privilege to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country wherever you may be joining us this morning. The VLF officers sit on Wurundjeri land and today I'm on Bunwarung country, both of course tribes of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders and to all the generations of Kulin Nation peoples and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. We recognise the impact of colonisation, its legacy of injustice and the marginalisation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples everywhere. And we believe that acknowledging the past is an essential step in building a better and more equitable future. Victoria Law Foundation aims to break down the barriers to justice for all Victorians through our work in research, grants and education. And we are genuinely committed to making a contribution to a better justice system for all of us, especially those vulnerable and most in need. Before we set sail this morning, a few housekeeping tips. If you, if you missed the whole slide, the uh, cameras and mics for all of you as attendees will be off for the duration of the webinar. And the chat function is just for technical issues, but you do have access to the Q&A function. And we would look forward very much to your putting your questions in there for Andrea and Alison's response at the end of their presentation and to upvote any questions that you see that other people have posed that you think uh, you like the look of as well. We are also recording the webinar and you will receive a link to the recording and to the PowerPoint presentation and other resources mentioned in the, in the show to come uh, shortly after we've finished. As I mentioned, Alison Hose and Andrea Staunton from VLA have very kindly given of their time today to share their experience some very diverse aspects of community legal education. And it struck me that at a time of increasing legal need and increasingly tight budgets, doing CLE well becomes even more critical. Alison and Andrea are, I think, very well known to many of you over their years of commitment in this area. But what you may not know is that Andrea ran away from private legal practice to join the circus. Well, not quite the circus, at least it was the cast of neighbours. And then she reverted to the law and came back to working in CLCs after her stint in, in acting, although I understand that she still dabbles uh, in, in, on the stage and can be seen in the southern reaches of, of uh, the metropolitan area very shortly in a production of Blythe Spirit, should you be interested. But in CLCs, she's managed volunteers, community legal education, law reform, and pro bono partnerships. So an extraordinarily broad sweep of exposure in uh, CLC activity. And she joined the CLE team at Victoria Legal Aid in 2017. So she's been around for quite some years, but Alison, sir, she joined the VLA 10 years ago. And before that, we had the pleasure of her company at the VLF, and before that, she was a writer and, educate, and editor rather in educational publishing and community arts organisations. When I read uh, Alison's short history or bio, it struck me that if it can be written or edited, Alison's done it. Books, magazines, brochures, fact sheets, websites, e-modules, videos, and a phone app. And she's worked to a very broad range of audiences in some pretty fascinating locations as well, including teaching creative writing in Phnom Penh, 
and participating in workshops at the Shakespeare and Company bookshop in Paris, which I have to say filled me with, with great envy and admiration. So you can see from their diverse backgrounds, the, the combination of Alison and Andrea is a powerful one at VLA. And there they've produced a range of community legal information, uh, including fact sheets, booklets, animations, digital COVID-19 legal information. They both have a passion for plain language, best practice, and making sure that we share our resources and knowledge across the sector. So Andrew, Andrea and Alison, we are very delighted to have you with us and very much looking forward to your presentation. And I will now cede the stage and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Lynn, for that uh, kind acknowledgement of country and your kind comments uh, for Ali and I. Feel that you might have overstated it a little bit. I'm not quite sure the neighbours people would regard me as part of the cast. I had such distinguished roles as passerby number two. So if you think, gee, she doesn't look famous, I'm not. Uh, but thank you anyway for that. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Uh, Ellie, can I have a thumbs up that you can see that okay? Fantastic. All right, so uh, I'll begin by just giving you a little overview of what it is we're going to talk about today. So we're going to introduce you to our Making Community Legal Information webpage, which some of you may have already seen, and if not, um, we invite you to do so after the session. Then we're going to share with you fast 15 tips for plain language and accessibility, some of our favourites. We're also going to talk to you about a real life example of how we used some of these resources to make fast and effective community legal information in a pandemic. Of course, you can all guess which one. Um, and then we invite you to ask us any question. Seriously, no question too big or too small. We are complete word nerds. We love this stuff and we'll really enjoy chatting to you about any aspect of the presentation or community legal information generally. Um, and then after the session, uh, you'll receive a virtual show bag, um, which is a fancy way of saying you'll get an email with a copy of our uh, PowerPoint presentation, a link to the Making Community Legal Information page, and our contact details, including our direct email and phone numbers. So uh, if you have a question that doesn't get answered today, we'd really love to continue the conversation with you after the session. So to get straight into it, um, this rather ugly looking URL uh, is a link to our Making Community Legal Information webpage. If the technology is kind to me, I will click on it. Yes, there we are, we're transported to it. So this is simply a web page on our website. Um, it's a little tricky to navigate to at the moment, but we are in the process of redeveloping our website and it will have a much uh, simpler URL after that. So in the meantime, you can just go to our homepage and type in the search box across the top, making community legal information, or you can navigate to it um, through community education and projects, um, or simply use the hyperlink that we're going to send you after this presentation. And with our new uh, website, the hyperlink you get today will continue to work. It'll be redirected. So the reason we created this page was because we wanted to share. We wanted to share our plain language guide, our style guide, and some other content um, creation resources that we use at Victoria Legal Aid. The important thing is you don't have to be a qualified editor to use these materials. Um, I don't have a background in writing and publishing, so I've approached this work with a fair degree of insecurity. Um, but I've absolutely loved these resources because they let me do my job better. And unlike law, where the answer to just about every question is it depends or maybe, there are really clear rules here that you simply apply and you can write more clearly and make your work more accessible to larger um, cohorts of the community, which is so important. Um, so I've really loved these resources and, and they've helped me enormously in my work and I, I hope they'll help you as well. So it's also a way for us to join up resources and research across the sector and beyond. So we're really excited to, to know that some of our colleagues from the legal assistance sector are here today and other people from other sectors. It's great that you're interested also and could join us. Um, we consulted with community legal centres 
about this and about how we could support their community legal information work. Uh, some of you will know that there was an access to justice review in Victoria a few years ago. Uh, and as a result of that, Victoria Legal Aid was given an expanded role to um, coordinate and make sure that legal information is current, accessible, of high quality and of sufficient breadth. So we chatted to our colleagues in community legal centres about how we can support them. And one of the things that came through was sharing some of these resources that we already have. Um, so we really appreciated that feedback and we're really pleased to be able to share this. Um, we're really open to feedback about this web page. It's a starting point, not the end point. We're on a journey just like everybody else and we're learning along the way too. So please, if you see something that you think isn't right or that you don't agree with or something that we've missed or you know of other resources that would be useful on this page, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We'd love to learn from you and consider anything else we can add to make this a better resource for all of us. So you can see on the page here, we've got a little bit about what community legal aid information is. And then we move on to the guides for creating community legal information. So especially we chat a bit about plain language and style, and that's going to come up in some of the tips that Ali and I will share with you. Um, and we link to our plain, plain language writing guide, um, which is largely consistent with the Australian government style manual. But the way we do it is we've collated a lot of things that are most relevant to us in our work um, for our lawyers to use, as well as our uh, legal educators and other staff. And anything that we don't have covered in the plain language writing guide, we defer to the Australian government style manual on. That's now an online resource. It used to be a book about this thick, but it's, um, okay, I'm prone to exaggeration. It was about that thick, uh, but it is now on online and quite easy to navigate. So that's a great resource as well. We use the Macquarie Dictionary for any spelling conventions in Australia. And we've also popped in some of our checklists, like the checklists that we use. It's a simple one pager that we use um, when we're proofreading and when we're um, proofing design and artwork as well. So you can see these things. And underneath, you'll see that we link to the Victoria Law Foundation. So we wanted to join up and, and just flag that there are workshops offered by the Victoria Law Foundation um, and pop that in there. We have a little section on accessibility. Um, again, with some links to resources like the People with Disability Australia Language Guide. Um, more links to some planning and scoping that you might like to do before creating resources. Um, and then we've got a little, a little mention of, about an area of work that we're, we're planning on doing later this year, which is looking at how we can amplify the work being done by community legal centres and others, how we can promote and perhaps link to resources that you might be creating. Um, and in the interest of fairness and transparency, we're, we're looking at developing some guidelines about how we can do that and consulting about that. But in the interim, we're very happy to consider any suggestions or requests on a case by case basis. So please feel free to get in touch with us. We also have a bit there about uh, effective community legal information. So we link to some of the evaluations that we've completed at Legal Aid and also um, some of the re research being done by the Victoria Law Foundation and um, further afield as well, going into state and overseas. And finally, we have a space there for other guides. So we currently link to the Community Legal Education Made Easy Guide that was produced by the Working Group of the Federation of Community Legal Centres. So that's it. Um, do we invite you to check that information out um, and to please uh, give us any feedback that you have about it. I'm gonna hand over to Ali now to start sharing some of our favorite uh, plain language and accessibility tips. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, and hi, everyone, welcome. Um, we thought we'd pick out some of the key tips that are in the guide that, and our guidelines uh, that we wanted to share. And we will just run through those really quickly. We're really happy to um, take any questions, as Andrea said, at the end about why we do particular things. And sometimes recommendations can change from um, organisation to organisation. But as we said, everyone has their way of doing things. We use a series of guidelines and tips to help us to streamline our work and to hopefully keep things as consistent as possible. And the first one, um, it's an oldie but a goodie, and it's one that you'll know, and it's avoid clutter. 
um, and use lots of white space. And you might think this is pretty obvious. Why are we starting with this chip? But it actually makes a huge difference to most audiences to be able to work their way through clean, clear information. And I think in our sector where we deal with a lot of information every day, the temptation to cram things in one more little bullet point onto a slide um, is almost overwhelming. So it's a reminder to us um, that this really important tip is actually the starting point, I think, for creating clear and accessible information. The next idea that we've included, the, the tip for plain language, is to include engaging images. A lot of your audience will be people that um, find visual images engaging, and um, it's just a nice way to, to help draw people in, whether you're writing in print or whether it's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it can help also to reinforce messages, tell a story, set a friendly tone, um, and to engage and entertain people. So for any of our publications, we purchase images. Um, unless they're created by our design team. In PowerPoint, I don't know if you've all noticed, but there's a heap of new stock images in PowerPoint that didn't used to be there. So it's well worth looking at the insert picture function. And there are illustrations, there are stickers, there are icons, and there's these sorts of, that's what this image is, really nice high resolution cutouts that you might like to use as well. So the next tip is to use you and we, which is basically about addressing your audience as directly as possible um, and trying to make sure that you're writing in a clear and friendly way and actually using that directly talking to someone, um, that first person I think helps if you're writing information, it helps you to avoid jargon and overwriting um, because you do have someone in mind as your audience. So for an example, we would say um, rather than VLA's library is open to the public, say you can use our library, it's just clearer and friendlier. Thanks, Ellie. Another is um, to stick to just one theme per sentence or if you're using PowerPoint per slide. Um, that can make it very complex if people have multiple ideas all, all woven in together. And we have a hard and fast rule for any written materials, maximum of 22 words per sentence. So you really can only fit one idea into that 22 words. Um, and the idea is it's much better to have two short sentences than one really long one. That's particularly important for people with lower literacy or people who might not speak English as their first language. So just stick to that one theme per sentence or slide. Use bullet points, but not too many. Um, breaking up your text, particularly if you've got chunks of text with bullet points is a really great way to make things more accessible and more readable. Um, and bullet points can highlight important issues and they can make your page look a lot cleaner. It's important though, not to use too many. If you start to use a long, long list of bullet points that can clutter up the page and seem overwhelming to your readers. So bullet points are great. Um, use them sparingly, but use them well where you can. And I think the other important aspect of, of um, breaking things into lists is that where we we only use numbered lists where we absolutely have to where there's a purpose for the reader in knowing why you know something might be numbered or ordered in a particular way um, we don't just add in numbered lists for for no reason at all so bullet points where you can um, and clean bullet points we use the little black dots um, but picking a clean bullet point can help to make your page look less, less cluttered as well uh, the next tip is to use simple everyday words. Um, it's really tempting to assume that people know what you mean, but they don't necessarily can't come from the same point. So, for example, um, if you're talking to the public or you're writing a publication, uh, don't say legislation or statute if you can simply say law. So you want to use simple words that people are more likely to know. Um, in our plain language guide that's on the Making Community Legal Information page, we have a list that runs for several pages alphabetically with examples of complex words and simple alternatives that you can use. Um, so, for example, instead of saying acquaint yourself with, you could say find out about. Or instead of saying alternatively, you can just say or. Instead of forthwith, you can say now or immediately. It's a very long list. Do check it out. It's astonishing when you see things and go, wow, why would I say it that complicated way? There's lots and lots of examples of how you can say things in simpler ways that will be more accessible to more people. 
avoid acronyms. Um, and this one might seem obvious again, but I think we're in a sector that really loves acronym soup. Uh, and I know the first uh, three to six months working in um, the legal sector and I came in from a, a non-legal background, I think it was probably six months before I was sitting in meetings and fully understanding all of the acronyms that people just use in their everyday life. So don't say VCAT, um, say Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. And then, you know, you can shorten it to tribunal if you're writing a document and people will understand what you mean. We try not to say uh, BLA in our public facing material. We, of course, all know that these acronyms or we start to learn them as we're working in the sector, um, but just keep in mind that they can be impenetrable for your audience um, if they've not been in contact with them. Thanks, Sally. We'll move on to the next, um, next group of tips, which are around simple style. Um, and uh, just a reminder as well to please pop any questions in the Q&A. We're looking forward to getting to those um, after we present. So one uh, which astonished me was when I discovered that all these all these rules about plain language and accessibility was that you should left align text. I always thought it looked prettier to have everything centered or justified, you know, where it stretches it out. So you have nice, neat margins down the left and right. Um, but unfortunately, in doing that, it stretches out the spaces, makes them uneven and makes it harder to read for people with lower literacy. So it's um, our, our rule is to have left aligned text with a ragged edge on the right. Use minimal capitals. So capitals actually interrupt the flow of reading and comprehension for readers with low literacy. Um, and there's something that I think we come across again a lot in our sector. I often get documents from our lawyers that are filled um, with sometimes pretty random capitalizations of words like court or magistrate. Um, and we make sure that we try to minimalize um, capitalization across our text wherever we can, just because it does have that impact um, on the reader of, uh, you know, try, it, it interrupts their comprehension basically. So we say court with a lowercase c wherever possible, unless we're referring directly to a specific court. Um, we apply the same rule when we're talking we're talking about magistrates and judges in general of course we capitalize if we're referring to a particular magistrate or judge um, and we talk about legal documents in the same way without kind of capitalizing affidavit or uh, you know other words that don't really need to be capitalized it's just something to keep an eye out um, again it's a habit uh, uh, for all of us I think in our sector that we do capitalize um, a lot of the time I think it's part of what people must learn when they're doing um, legal drafting and it's something that we really need to watch out for when we're doing information for the broader community. Another rule we try to stick to is to use minimal punctuation. Um, again, a shocker to me when I started learning about this, but punctuation can also clutter things up and make it harder and more confusing for readers. It can be a bit of a distraction. So, for example, on bullet lists, we don't put semicolons after each bullet. We just leave it open if it's... Um, a segment or a, like a phrase, and we only use a full stop if it's a full sentence. Um, for a bullet list, we will often just put a, a full stop at the end of the bullet list. Um, there's no need for full stops in headings or subheadings. Um, and we use single quotation marks instead of double quotation marks, even for direct speech. Um, and again, that's just to reduce the clutter and the distraction for readers. And all of these are covered in the plain language writing guide that you can access from the web page. Um, avoid symbols like ampersands or um, you know all kinds of symbols really and this is partly because not everyone will necessarily recognize the symbols or know what they mean particularly if they've learnt um, a different language and they read and write in a different language than English um, but it's also that the screen screen readers don't necessarily pick up and clearly read out um, signals so one example which I didn't know and Andrea um, put this in the in our example is that if you put in one plus one with a plus sign um, it actually won't pick up the plus sign if you've got a screen reader going through that text. Something to be really aware of and just minimising symbols wherever you can. Another is to use bold for emphasis. So not capital letters. We don't want to shout at people, but to use bold, but only for a few words. We tend to not do it for more than about three words. Uh, just to draw emphasis to particular words with never bold big chunks of text. Again, that's actually harder to read. You'll start noticing all of these things when you're reading uh, publications and other things. You'll start noticing, wow, that actually really is harder to read in bold. So we really do keep it to a minimum. 
Yeah, these are small things, but as Andrea said, they actually make a big difference for readers, um, particularly readers with um, lower literacy or with um, difficulty with comprehending as they're reading. Only underline hyperlinks, and this is a big one. Um, we get underlined headings uh, in our material, underlines for emphasis, all kinds of different ways that people do it. Um, particularly for millennials reading, anything that's underlined is a hyperlink. They're going to click on it if it's a, on a screen because they think that they're going to be able to link to something. But in general, that has just become part of the established um, kind of understanding that most people have when they're reading text. And it's a really important one, I think, to sort of don't use other things as it's bold is another thing you can use for emphasis. Try not to use underline unless you've got a link that will take someone to some information. Um, and on screens, we only ever use italics for titles, cases or legislation. We don't use italics for emphasis. However, in printed materials, you can use italics for emphasis. So italics, if you're not familiar with them, is that when the, the writing sort of slants to the right, um, those are italics. So we would say just for titles and cases, if, if it's an online presentation or like digital content or PowerPoint, but in print, you can use italics for emphasis like you would use bold in a PowerPoint. Um, but just a few words again, keep it, keep it limited. And use simple clear fonts um, and use text size uh, in documents. We use at least size 11, Arial 11. Um, and I think the recommendations that I've read are about anything lower than about Arial 10 um, becomes really, really difficult for a large chunk of the population to read. So that's people with lower literacy, but also people that, um, you know, are just reading on a page and maybe um, don't have a, a great vision. Um, on PowerPoint slides, we use a minimum of size 20, which sounds huge, um, but it actually is much, much more readable. And it does help with all the other tips as well about white space and keeping things clean and minimal text and points on slides. So um, just keep in mind that, that, again, the temptation, if you've got a lot of information, you're trying to cram it into a two page fact sheet is just maybe to go down half the size with your text, um, but try not to do that if you can help it, the bigger it is um, and the more, the more readable it is for you for your audience. And as much as we have included these accessibility tips um, and plain language tips, which are super important when you're dealing with members of the community and trying to explain legal issues to them or any other issues if you're outside of the legal assistance sector, they're also really helpful for any communications that you do, whether you're emailing a colleague, whether you're writing a letter to a client, um, whether you're drafting a submission for a funder, um, even people with high literacy uh, find plain language much easier to read and, and digest and it's more approachable. It's less daunting than giant chunks of text with really, really long sentences. So what we find is that everybody appreciates plain language, um, including overworked professionals and also including people with high literacy who are feeling particularly stressed or emotional, such as someone with a court case. Um, so it is really good to apply across all areas of work if you're able to. I'm going to invite Ali now to share a real life example with you of how we use some of these principles to create fast and effective community legal information. Yeah, so we wanted to give you um, a kind of practical real life example, you know, it's not just a series of random tips, um, we, but you know, how do we apply those and how do we make them meaningful um, in our work and for the, the information we're producing for the community. And so we thought a, a good example and an example that's fresh both in Andrea's mind and my mind, I think, is um, our shift at the start of 20, March 2020 to producing COVID-19 legal information. Um, and so as the, uh, the world started to change, um, we started to get intel from our legal helpline um, telling us that people were calling with very specific legal queries um, linked to the changes and the, you know, what was going on in society more broadly um, with COVID-19 and with some of the restrictions that were coming in. And so our um, callers, our, our staff were starting to get calls about this and we realised there was a need to produce uh, legal information about COVID-19 and about the new rules and the changes to the rules um, that particularly address people at that level. So not going, you know, we, we we knew that there was a lot of information out there for people, there was a lot of health information, there was a lot of stuff about restrictions and what people could and could not do, um, but there were a series of um, legal implications for in ordinary people's lives around, um, around those things. So for example, people with parenting arrangements in place um, when you know things were shutting down, borders were closing, there were questions about how do they actually keep to those arrangements, do they have to keep to those arrangements, all those sorts of things started to come flooding in. So in response 
response to the demand, um, we in community legal education at, at Victoria Legal Aid, we worked with our digital communications team and they manage our website um, to coordinate a whole lot of information, um, fact sheets, very short and um, sharp fact sheets for people in, uh, on, on COVID-19 legal topics. Everything, as I said, from ch um, parenting issues, child protection, workplace issues, border closures. And some of these, we worked with subject matter experts um, amongst our own staff, but we were also able to work with subject matter experts in community legal centres. So Job Watch, for example, um, did a, a huge and fantastic amount of information on employment issues. And we were able to uh, link to some of the information. I think they linked to our information. We we're able to complement the work that we were doing, um, that each organisation was doing to get information out there really quickly to the community. And because we had to work so quickly um, and in such unusual and chaotic circumstances, we worked outside of our usual processes at Legal Aid um, and outside our comfort zones, as Andrea and I remember very well, um, to get the information up as quickly as we could. Um, but we were able to use the scaffolding, I suppose, of our plain language guide, um, the tips and tricks that we've just run through with you, our checklist, all of the sort of infrastructure that we had in place to produce community legal information. We were able to use that to help us to sort of move quickly and to help us to figure out what to do and to sort of adapt our processes as we needed to. And there were a few sort of key things that we established that we thought it would be worth sharing, um, you know, about how we worked and how we used our, our scaffolding um, that might give you a sense of how you might be able to do that in your own organisations um, or, you know, and I know that many of you already are doing that in your own organisations to produce material quickly in response to community need. So, as I said earlier, we linked to rather than duplicated um, other high quality information that was out there. JobWatch was a, um, a good example of, of information that we could link to. But we also, um, you know, we tried to make sure that we weren't repeating information that was out there on big government websites, for example, about restrictions and um, health information. We'd link to that. Um, and that also assisted us, particularly when restrictions were changing so quickly, it assisted us to kind of really focus on the legal information and the legal messages that people needed um, and to link off to the sort of nitty gritty detail that was changing constantly, sometimes weekly, um, you know, about the types of restrictions that were in place. We also um, had to, we, we tried to have a process in place where we were writing and drafting information very quickly, um, but we were working directly with our subject matter experts. Um, and a lot of the time that was stuff within legal aid, but we would go outside if we needed to as well. Um, and we'd also try and have at least one additional set of eyes proofreading the information that we produced. So it was a process of making sure that the information was legally accurate and current, and that was incredibly important, obviously, um, but also trying to make sure that we did do that basic quality control, um, I mean, making sure we were using plain language, that the information that we produced was not only legally current, but was actually useful and understandable to someone who was coming to a web page to try and source some information, often in situations where they were very stressed um, you know everyone was very stressed in that broader context in society but people who were perhaps getting a fine um, because they'd breached a restriction or people who were trying to navigate parenting arrangements or who were trying to figure out what to do because they'd just lost their job or all the casual work that they had um, previously relied upon they needed that information really quickly and they needed it to be um, clear and accessible. The frustration, I can't imagine for someone in that situation, you know, having to kind of wade through um, information that wasn't plain language, it would just add so much to the stress and frustration that people, um, you know, are feeling. And so that, those quality control things that can sort of seem finicky and, you know, oh, it's a bit nitpicky, why are you bothering? I think that actually really does make a big difference um, in terms of the the, you know, the way that people can get and access information and figure out what to do, um, depending on their circumstances very, very quickly. So that focus that we had on moving quickly and trying to really directly address the need as it was arising, but also making sure we ticked off some of those quality control, um, plain language guides. Uh, and, and rules, I think, was really important. We did things that we, in, on the page Andrea mentioned, we have a couple of checklists that are really straightforward and simple um, that we use just as we were producing a page, we would use that checklist at the very end just to make sure that we ticked off um, on all of the proofing and plain language rules and to make sure that the information was accessible. 
we um, tried to consider things like the shelf life of information. So again, you know, not kind of putting in so much detail that information would go out of date within a week, but trying to link off to detail where we could, trying to make information as to have as, as long a shelf life as it was possible um, within all of that. And we also um, tried to make sure that we were constantly trying to monitor and um, assess whether or not what we were producing was actually useful for people. So we took part across legal aid, we had fortnightly um, data meetings, we called them, where we just had staff from our legal helpline, from our comms team, um, from community legal education and others might pop in and out as needed. And that was just about assessing um, the data that we did have about um, with the pages that we were producing. And because we were doing web pages, we were lucky to have things like page views, the amount of time people were spending on a page, um, where they were coming from often. And that stuff was useful in terms of assessing whether or not what we were making was kind of useful or relevant for people in real time. Um, and it was an import important part of the process. We, we couldn't obviously didn't have the time or resources to do some extensive evaluation of what we were doing, but just checking in on a fortnightly basis and using the data and the information that we could sort of collect almost without even thinking about it, um, that was helpful in terms of assessing how we were going as well. Um, and we also used social media, so um, Facebook, I think Twitter, newsletters, and some of our um, connections with um, community legal centres and other organisations that pushed information out to the community. We used those networks to try and promote our pages um, wherever we could. And the COVID-19 legal information pages um, were the most visited topics on our website in 2020 to 2021. So um, they had a higher volume of traffic um, and some of the pages had a long um, time that people were spending on the page, which to us indicated that, you know, that they were actually engaging with that information um, and trying to sort of use it, hopefully, to figure out um, and navigate their way through the very difficult circumstances that everyone found themselves in. So in total, I think between March and about July um, in 2020, we made 22 web pages, which was about 25,000 words of content um, and two short animated videos that were made for young people um, in the child protection system. And so they, um, they didn't necessarily have access to a whole lot of or need a whole lot of printed information. They just needed short, sharp information and we were able to use um, an animating, uh, some animating software that Andrea had um, come across to make information very quickly for that audience as well. And it was an example, as I said, of having to sort of really jump to it, produce information quickly, try to keep it as high quality as we possibly could, um, despite the difficulties that we were facing and using all of the existing resources and infrastructure that we had in place that, you know, sometimes day to day, it can seem like, well, you know, you're not necessarily engaging with all of this stuff, but it can become in very handy and be really useful in a situation where there's high need um, and high stress and a lot of information um, to churn through. So that's our sort of real life example, I guess, of how we use all the resources that sit on our community legal information, making community legal information page. Um, and we hope that some of those resources will be useful to you too, and um, that they'll be, you'll be able to use them in the same sort of way um, as you're making your own information. Or well, Natalie, while you were talking, it reminded me that one of the the great things about that legal information was that other people did link to it. So rather than recreating the same information that we had just done and that we'd already had legally checked and followed plain language guidelines for some other community legal centers and other networks and things simply sent out the links to our information or included links to our information on their websites which meant people were always getting to the latest version and we have mentioned on the making community legal information page that anything we produce is subject to creative commons license you're very welcome to reuse it repurpose it but whenever you can it's even better to simply link to it so that you're always getting the most up-to-date version um, so that was another another win with that information so that takes us up to the really exciting part of the presentation where we hand over to your questions which we'll hopefully be able to answer so I'll stop screen sharing now and hand over to you Lynn. Thank you ever so much uh, Andrea and Alison. Music to my ears especially I mean so many things but I have had a particular loathing for maximal punctuation for years and years and years and I have to say I think the the, the legal uh, community particularly cleaves to the semicolon in a way that um, that few other professions do. So I've been trying to get rid of those rages and single quote marks as opposed to double quotes. 
thank you. Thank you for validating my, um, my campaign for the last several years. Um, we've got a few questions and, and obviously please uh, jot down your further questions into the Q&A function right now if you'd like us to get to you. Uh, having said that, Alison and Andrea are very kindly happy to continue the conversation afterwards if we don't have time. A couple of things I think we can respond to quite quickly. Is there a reason you call them bullet points over dot points? Leonie would prefer us to, to use the word dot, which I think is probably, you know, appropriate to the shape and thing. <laughs> but um, is there a distinction in your mind between dot and bullet? No, no, not in my mind. And dot is much more plain language than bullet point. You're absolutely right. Right. Let's go with dot points from here on. how much fun this is. I've written that down. Can see them <laughs> dot points from now on. Thank you for Yoni, that. You, you have made a, a, an extraordinarily important contribution to the, to the greater knowledge of, of plain language. Thank you for that. Um, and also a question regarding the VLA website font size. I think the point you were making was that that, that online red content was a minimum of 11 point, is that right? But a PowerPoint was 20, am I getting that correct? I think the 11 was for... Oh, sorry, Ali. <laughs> See, we're so excited about this. We're both bursting in. <laughs> sorry, do you want me to keep going now? I'm hogging the mic, Ali. Um, 10 for on, on screen, online, uh, 11 for print, 20 for PowerPoint. Right. Okay. That's our rule of thumb, although there may be some variation with different fonts. The main point is that it's a good readable size and that it's a clear, simple font. Good. Thank you for clarifying that. And Simon has uh, wondered if there are any further tips you can offer regarding the use of hyperlinks, how to use them in documents that are printed as, as well as those that are online, where it's you know, clearly very simple to just click on the link and how to avoid them disrupting the flow of information. Um, I've got some thoughts about that, but I will cede to the expertise in the room. Ali, do you want to pick that up? Oh, I'd love to hear your thoughts too, Lynn, but I think there's two things that spring to mind and that's using um, intuitive language in your links. So instead of saying, um, click here, um, telling, saying, you know, visit the Victoria Legal Aid website for information about child protection, for example, you use the description of what the link actually is um, within the text and that helps with screen readers um, and with people being able to work out where they're going if they're navigating their way through information. Um, the other thing, uh, the second thing I was going to say with hyperlinks as well. Oh, in terms of um, how to how to navigate printing out information from the web with hyperlinks, it is a dilemma. I've noticed in our new website um, where you have the option to print, say from the um, a topic page, you have the option to print that page um, as a little fact sheet in a very simplified format. It will actually spell out URLs um, for you. So that's just part of the, the new system that we have. And I think that's something that's being rolled out across big government and public sector websites and hopefully will improve in the future. But that's one way of um, addressing it. And then I suppose being aware where that can't happen, just being aware that you might have to spell out um, simple URLs for people would be, um, you know, if you know that they're going to be printing, um, it's just something to keep in mind. The world of URLs is, is another whole conversation in terms of how they get named and, um, and what plain language implications they have. But the, the last part of Simon's question is really about links within links. And I suppose that goes to if you have, for example, uh, click here for further information about child protection, you go to that link and then from that link you have further links. And once again, that sort of ends up, uh, as he describes it, in a babushka doll or a sort of rabbit um, whole of, of links in links in links, which, you know, if you've got time on your hands can be fun <laughs> and take you into uncharted territory. But is there some thought given to how far down that road uh, it's appropriate to send people? Yeah, when we can, we actually curate the list. So like on our web pages, we'll say for more information about this particular aspect, and we'll link to that particular aspect for information about this part of the question, go to here. So we try to guide it a little bit. We also have other resources like template emails that we send out and it's a resource that community legal centres can also use. And that also sort of gives a little bit of narration about what the links are and, and links that hopefully gives them the more targeted links that they can click on for their legal issues rather than just go to this page and then figure it out for yourself. Yes, um, plow on. We, yeah. And we're conscious of that and, and try to make it a bit easier. But I do understand how it can become a bit of a 
for Bushka doll. Yes, yes you, you can also um, you can also build your web pages or ask the developer to do it in a way that means that people perhaps if they're clicking on links internally to other information on your website, it just takes them there and they can click back and forth um, using the breadcrumbs. But if you're opening a different website for a different organisation, it might it opens it in a new page so you don't lose the original information you came from. So there's ways that um, websites can be built to try and assist with that. Um, but obviously not every every website out there um, has consistent uh, consistent approach in that way. Um, I think it's something we are trying to do with our new website to keep it consistent. The technical, the intersection between technical and and clarity, I think, is is getting much better. We're 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 getting stronger at using uh, the tech the tech tricks that we can to make uh, to make uh, information more accessible and and uh, and clearer. I'm going to race through a few more questions because we've we've got lots now. While I've got you, Andrea, what's the animation software you used? Uh, we used Animaker. 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 Okay. Yeah. And is that freely available or do you so there need is, to subscribe? There is a free version um, with a lot of limitations. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a, a paid version of it because we could access then more diverse character types and more props and scenes. Um, it was something we sort of figured out as we were making it. It's user-friendly enough that I could self-teach and come up with some videos along with um, Kirsty, who was in our team at the time. So we were able to do it. I don't have any particular tech skills. I just like learning new things. So we were able to puzzle that out. The voiceover was me sitting in my basement with the uh, Christmas decorations with a microphone on my mobile phone. Uh, this was COVID and we had to just do things as best we could. So they may not be quite as uh, as professional as you might see otherwise, but we were acting within constraints and Animaker did enable us to do that. So that, that was what we use, but I'm open to hearing about other products that. Sure. Okay, if people want to recommend others, please put those in, in the Q&A too, and we'll try and lift those for you and send them through as well in the email. How do you get lawyers to accept the removal of semicolons and random capital letters? So I, I don't know the answer to that other than beating it out of them with with um, a red pen, which is my my approach. But um, any any tips? Well, we I do find that explaining to our lawyers that it actually makes it easier for the client or the end user um, that it and it you know it can block their comprehension to information if there's too much of you know too much punctuation too too many capitalizations I, that that starts to penetrate I think after a while because the focus for you know, all of our lawyers is to try and do their very, very best for their clients. So I, approaching it from that end rather than, um, you know, I'm just being picky because I'm the editor of this text, but trying to sort of explain it, I think is um, is useful. And we also have the authority and, we, you know, we're very pleased to have the authority at VI of our plain language guide <laughs> and all the information on our Making Community Legal Information page that we can, um, we can say these decisions have been made um, yes. across the organisation. So best of luck uh, <laughs> on that score. And do you have a view on footnotes and versus endnotes in printed material? Footnotes or endnotes? Hmm. Thoughts? Do you use either of them, by the way? Only in um, materials like submissions and reports, um, not in anything that we'd be producing for the public, um, other than the fact our annual report is, of course, a public document. But anything that's really targeted in, in the sense of community legal information, we would never use footnotes or endnotes. For what it's worth me personally, if I was reading a report, I prefer footnotes, but that's just personal preference. Do, do you have any thoughts on it, Ali? I, I personally prefer footnotes as well, but that, I don't know whether there's any, um, I don't know of any guidelines around that in terms of um, accessibility and plain language. I think Andrea's right. The main thing with information for community is that any information, it should be in the body text, um, you know, and there needs to be a way to work it in one, some, one way or another, not sitting outside of the page, you know, not sitting somewhere else, but people need to read and understand the information um, and the hierarchy of information, it, its importance as they go. That would be one that we'd be checking out the Australian government style manual. So anything that we don't cover in our guide, although I think we actually do cover footnotes in our style I guide. I think FBLA like we footnote. Yeah. yeah. Um, working with researchers who write in a very particular way, another whole ball game. But, uh, that's another conversation again. Um, Kamaji, Kamaji asks, I'm always confused whether I should use bullet points or arrows or one, two, three, four points or numbered points. Can I please get 
a bit of understanding on where to use which. I think you did mention your preference for dot points, as we're now calling them, thank you, Leonie, um, as opposed to other forms, and only to use numbered uh, points where the numbering is particularly relevant to the sequence or some other aspect of, of understanding. Is that a fair summary? That's right, and to keep it really simple, so we just use the black circle, the dot, um, arrows and things could be a bit distracting and numbers only if it needs to be done in a particular order. If it's step one, this, then that, only if there's a purpose to numbers would we use them. Otherwise, stick with the dot points, it's simpler. What about hierarchies of dot points? So you end up <laughs> with, with sort of your black dot point and then your sort of cleared circle indented a bit and you know, yeah. layer upon layer. I think we have been guilty of that um, in the in the past, Lynn. I'm pretty sure we have. I have noticed when we're working on content for our new website that it doesn't actually have, um, it doesn't allow a hierarchy of um, dot points in that way. And so we do have to pull, you know, we have to pull out information and re-edit and reorganise it if we've got levels of um, of dot points. I think probably that, I, I, again, I, don't, I can't point to the research on this, but I think just gut instinct is they'd be less... Um, accessible for people potentially and it's probably better to edit in a way that you have a point and the dot points and perhaps you're pulling out your text so that you've got another um, paragraph a point and more dot points um, and having that single layer or level of dot points is clearer. Good sense. Um, I'm going to whip through the last couple. I know that we're pushing people for time but I think we, we can go to these last couple of questions because this is a really useful one I think. What are your views on displaying legal cases using the legal convention of Smith v. Jones, for example, so you know, um, the, the V in the middle. How should we manage this in terms of accessibility, but also for people who speak English as a second language and for whom the V in the middle is, is uh, unknown? I think the simple answer to that is we would never, ever be telling clients about a particular case or legal precedent. We would just be saying the law says you must this or the law says this. They don't need to know whether it's case law, statute. Clients don't need to know. They just need to know what the law says. So we would just never quote a case in any, or, or an act for that matter, um, in any publication that was meant for members of the public. Anything to add on that, Ali? No, I agree with that, absolutely. Um, and I think, yeah, I think the, again, it's uh, that tendency that we have in our sector that we we take in a lot of information and need the very detailed information. So you think your client does as well, but they really don't. I think that's an, uh, an excellent sort of higher order point that you need to put yourself in the, in the place of the, of the reader and think about very as clearly as you possibly can, what is it they need to know, as opposed to what is it I feel I should tell you which is a very different thing. Ben has written us an essay. So let me uh, just whip through this as best I can. Wondering in relation to the range of capabilities of the community, there's been a movement from the courts to provide more worked examples, sample case files to show what a mere completed matter actually looks like. Are there views that this format along with some video explanation or other written breakdown may assist people navigating as many people continue to be required to self-represent in complex matters? Because the video tends to be prohibitive for some, but with videos on YouTube, do you think that video standards will be a thing in the future in terms of CLE production? And have we been historically too polished to be functional? I think I might uh, hold, hold the question there because there's so many bits to that, but I think that's a really interesting point. Have we insisted too much on polish and I suppose over informing in order to be functional and and the whole idea of using video in a much much more um, transactional way i suppose in terms of, of uh, both receiving and giving information i think there's lots of opportunity isn't there and that's something where we've learnt with all the working from home and um in my example of recording voiceovers uh, downstairs and using my phone and the feedback we got was that these resources didn't have to be perfect. That was temporary content. It didn't have to be perfect as long as it was accurate and clear. Um, and I know, you know, making resources for women in prison, for other things, they've also said to us, we, we don't care about perfect production quality. It's about finding the balance though, isn't it? Because you still need it to be professional enough and, and, and follow your, your plain language guides and things. Like there are some things that we would say we wouldn't compromise on, but maybe production quality is something that we have to consider into the future. Much more in that, uh, in that comment from 
uh, and as, as Monica Ferrari, one of your colleagues has pointed out, we will get back to you, Ben, and, and sort of continue that conversation. But one um, final question, which I think takes us right back to, to accessibility, what grey level equivalent do you aim for? And this is about uh, ling uh, levels of, of English uh, literacy and use. Health info is, is the grade five equivalent. Do you, do you have a standard? So the Australian Government Style Manual has a standard of Year 7. So they suggest that all content should be to Year 7 level because around 44% of the population have literacy at around about that point. Um, and, and also that even people with higher qualifications don't necessarily read at the level that matches their qualification. So um, again, it's better to have simpler information. So yeah, Year seven is what we aim for. Thank you both very, very much for all your insights. And I know that I could keep this conversation going for another hour or so. It would be a hoot. But I think I, mean, I was thinking as, as you were talking that the, the, the point that kept recurring to me was the step back from the style guides and the printed page, which is to quote, I think, Winston Churchill, though many have claimed it, I'm sure, that concision is, is, the, is the challenge here and that clarity is, is critical and that whenever you sit down to write something or to make some kind of uh, community legal information, you need to know what it is you're doing, what you're trying to say and who for or who to. And if you bear those things in mind, then uh, writing a short letter can sometimes take longer than writing a long one, which is the, the Churchill quote. But I think be, being very purposeful in terms of what it is you're trying to achieve can help a lot uh, even before you, you hit the keyboard. Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you both very much indeed. It's been a joy as always to catch up with you and thank you for all your work. Um, I will certainly be heading over to the, to the website and to the new content and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again down the track for better information sessions in the future. Let's just do one on punctuation, for example, that would be fun. <laughs> um, and don't forget, of course, if you're watching this, then all the tips that, uh, that you've just heard about are particularly useful in the build up to, to Law Week, if you're, uh, even when you're communicating about the event that you'll, you'll be running, and then of course, presenting it either online or in person. Uh, I think all this content is incredibly valuable in that context. So thank you again for attending. And we look forward to you joining us again for further better, better information sessions down the track. And go well, have a lovely day. <laughs>